Okay, today we continue our verse-by-verse -verse study through the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, a practical study, hopefully. We come today to Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. And Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. Now this abyss, or this bottomless pit, has been kept locked, so whatever or whoever is in it must be bad. Well, it's going to be unlocked, as we will see. It says in verse 2, When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and the sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. And out of the smoke locusts came down upon the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. This vision portrays an attack against the wicked who reject Christ. God will attack those who spurn his mercy in favor of their sin. You know, no one has a license to sin. God has not issued anyone a license to sin. All sin breaks God's law, and all lawbreakers will be punished by the God of justice unless they repent and find forgiveness through Jesus Christ the Savior. Verse 5. They were not given power to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes a man. During those days men will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. The locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. On their heads they, were, they wore something like crowns of gold, and their faces resembled human faces. Their hair was like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. They had tails and stings like scorpions, and in their tails they had the power to torment people for five months. Well, if there was ever a preview of hell, this is it. These people long for death, but they can't die. They long to go out of existence, but they cannot. They can't escape their terrible pain. Nothing works. God is saying, wake up before it's too late. Five months of constant pain may seem like hell, but it's nowhere near as bad as hell. People in hell wish they would only be in pain for five months. They feel it nonstop forever. So, if anything, this vision shows a prototype of hell a preview of things to come. It's a wake-up call. Repent before it's too late. Verse 11. They had as king over them the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek Apollyon. The locusts who came out of the pit represent demons, and the lead demon who directs them is called, well, his name means destroyer. God gives these demons permission to hurt the ungodly who reject his mercy and the demons hit them with all they've got. Do you know that demons hate people? Demons hate people? Satan hates people. It is impossible to get on the good side of the devil because he has no good side. He doesn't care about those who give in to his temptation. He doesn't feel 
that he owes anything to those who sin against the God that he hates? The devil and his demons hate the people who follow them as much as they hate God-loving, Christ-loving Christians. And given the chance, they will torment anyone that they possibly can, and that's exactly what you see happening right here. These aren't holy Christians that the demons are going after. These are, these are the people who serve them. There's no loyalty among demons. Verse 12. God says the first woe is past. Two other woes are yet to come. And so the pain and torment that we have just seen is just a small example, or a small sample, I should say, of what is to come. And so to those who haven't repented, God says, the worst is yet to come. It will not get better for those who reject Christ as Lord and Savior. And they're running out of time quickly. That's the message here. Verse 13, the sixth angel sounded his trumpet, and I heard a voice coming from the horns of the golden altar that is before God. It said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of the mounted troops was two hundred million. I heard their number. The horses and riders I saw in my vision looked like this. Their breastplates were fiery red dark blue and yellow as sulfur. The heads of the horses resembled the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. A third of mankind was killed by the, <clears throat> excuse me, the three plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur that came out of their mouths. The power of the horses was in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails were like snakes, having heads with which they inflict injury. So this vision... It pictures another fierce and deadly army of demons. Like 200 million rabid pit bulls. They're let out of their cage and notice they immediately attack Christ rejecting impenitent sinners. And as a result, billions of sinners suffer a painful death before entering an even more painful eternity. No matter what, one must give up to become a Christian. It is worth it to avoid the horrible alternative. That's the message that God wants his world to hear. Verse 20. The rest of mankind that were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping the demons the, and idols of gold, silver, bronze, wood, and stone, idols that cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. So in spite of God's wrath, sinful man who cherished their rebellion against God refused to change. They continued to indulge in the sin that's killing them. And they continue to serve the devil who hates them. Well, they might not be aware of it, but that's what they're doing. If one doesn't serve the Lord God, then by default they are doing the will of the devil. And like brute beasts, the people mentioned here are headed to this slaughter. God's warnings mean absolutely nothing to them. Their wickedness has dulled their senses and darkened their minds and has brought them to the precipice of damnation. Chapter 10 Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun and his legs were like fiery pillars. Angels are powerful. All angels are powerful. This one was exceptionally powerful. God gives angels power so that they can help Christians. That's what the Bible teaches. At least that's one, one reason. God gives angels whatever they need in order to help us when we need that help. If we're on God's side, 
through Jesus Christ, then angels are on our side. Look at one and two together. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun and his legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And this angel is making a statement on behalf of God. Sure looks like it to me. With one foot on the sea and one foot on the earth, he's saying the kingdom of heaven owns this planet. I claim this planet in the name of Almighty God. And if sinners don't like that, they can complain to me. They can complain to this huge angel and see how far they get. Verse 3. And he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. And when he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. He gave a loud shout. This huge angel with one foot in the sea, one foot on land, gives a loud shout and it sounds like a lion. If by some chance the people in the vicinity did not notice this angel, he has their attention now. That's for sure. He roared like a lion. And one thing you can't do is ignore a lion's roar. This angel is delivering the word of God and it comes equipped. The word of God comes equipped with the power of a lion's roar. Even when it's spoken softly. The power of God's word is not, is not in the yelling of it. God's word doesn't have to be yelled. Some people, they'll listen to a preacher who screams. And they mistaken, mistakenly believe that that's the power of the word. Or that's an anointing from God. No, it isn't. It's him yelling. The word of God comes equipped with power. Even when it's spoken softly, it commands respect, just like a lion's roar. When the written word of God is spoken, there needs to be reverence and there should be a holy hush from everyone who hears. Verse 4. It says, And when the seven thunder spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven say, Seal up what the seven thunders has, have said, and do not write it down. And so John was about to write what he heard. He's been writing everything that he heard and seen so far, and that was out of obedience to God who told him to do that. But when it came to this, God said, Don't write it down. Keep this a secret. Which tells us that God has withheld certain things from us. Certain things in general and more specifically about the end times. There are certain things we don't know about the end times. That is, that is why there are so many well-meaning Christians who love the Word of God, love the Lord Jesus Christ, they differ when it comes to end times. It's because God has not filled us in on all the details. Good news is He has told us all that we need to know. We can understand plenty from the plain truth of scripture. So we ought to worry about applying that and believing that and not waste our time trying to figure out what God has not made clear and certainly not divide over differences of opinions and differences of interpretation concerning things that aren't that clear. Verse five, then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it, and said, there will be no more delay. In other words, some translations say, there will be time no more. Time began when God created the world. Time will end when he destroys the world. Time is limited. For a limited time, God's people must be faithful when it isn't easy. For a limited time, evil, cr 
Christ-rejecting sinners have an opportunity to repent and be forgiven. Everything in this world has a time limit. Verse 7. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to his servants the prophets. It's called the mystery of God. And this goes right along with what we saw in verse 4. God has a plan. The exact details of that plan are known only to him. That plan, which is no doubt written in Scripture, but understood completely only by God, will fall into place exactly the way He wants it to. And if we're smart, we'll jump on the Jesus bandwagon and stay put no matter what. No matter what it may cost. Because God's plan, we do know, calls for all who are in Christ and remain in Christ to be safe and happy in the end when time is no more. Verse 8. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Go take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. I wouldn't want that job. That massive angel whose roar is like a lion, no one in their right mind would try to take anything from that big, powerful angel whose roar could sever a head from its body. No one in their right mind would do it unless God told them to do it. You see, then no one in their right mind would dare not do it. Lesson. Obey God, even when it is intimidating. Obey God, even if you feel uneasy. Obey in spite of your pounding heart. You will be glad that you did. Verse 9. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me a little scroll. He said to me, Take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. That scroll, that book, represents the Word of God. John was told to take it and eat it. In other words, he consumed the word. So he ate it, and at first he said it tasted good. But then after a while it gave him a stomachache. It it was not so good. When we read the Bible, when we take in the word of God or hear it taught, that's a good thing. It's a positive thing. It strengthens our soul. But often, when the message sinks in, it leaves us sad over our sins and over the sins of others. We need to take in the Word of God because it's good for us. It is good for us. But we should not expect it to always be a positive experience. And here's why. We are not always good. The world is not always good. So the word of God, which confronts bad, will not always be pleasant. Verse 11. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. Now, John just experienced the word of God not being a pleasant thing. And then he is told, to preach the word, to prophesy means to preach the word all over the world. That's the command. Now, the word of God is not always pleasant. But as the angel said, it still must be proclaimed. Even when it's not pleasant to the ears, it must be proclaimed because it is truth. It is God's word. Now, if the only time we're going to proclaim God's word is when it's pleasant, like I heard one very famous and very wealthy preacher say I have a positive message I I don't talk about sin I don't talk about the cross I don't talk about that I don't talk about any of that negative stuff yeah that's why he's a multimillionaire 
And he is also out of God's will. He is a hireling, not a shepherd. If the only time we'll proclaim God's word is when it is pleasant, then we're going to have to teach vague little sermonettes which neither edify, inform, nor rile. And in that case, we might as well do nothing. Because it's not really the pure word of God that's being proclaimed. And therefore, it won't do anyone any good. Oh, it'll make them feel good. But it's not going to do them any good. God expects his preachers to proclaim his word clearly enough to make the good feel good and the bad feel bad so that the good will be encouraged and so that the bad will repent. And if a preacher isn't doing that, he ought to get out of the pulpit. He ought to quit. Chapter 11. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the worshipers there. But exclude the outer court. Do not measure it. Because it has been given to the Gentiles. Those are people without God, by the way. It has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. Now, it may surprise you to learn that bad people cannot do bad without God's permission. It may surprise you even more to learn that sometimes, like here, God does give them that permission. You say, why would he do that? Well, one reason is that God has given man a free will. So naturally, some will choose to do bad. Another reason is that God uses bad to bring about a greater long-term good for his people. And that's exactly what he did when he allowed wicked men to murder his son. And if God's own son went through torture and death in the, in the will of God, no Christian should think that they ought to be exempt from suffering. 3. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. So God says, I've got two preachers. He's talking about his, his two special preachers here, and they're clothed in sackcloth as they proclaim the word of God. Sackcloth was very uncomfortable. God's preachers are not called to strive for personal comfort. They are called to proclaim God's uncomfortable truth to comfortable sinners who shouldn't be comfortable. And when a preacher does that, their life will not be one of continuous comfort, believe me. In fact, the only preachers who are always comfortable in this world are those who have compromised holiness standards so much that no one can even tell that they're Christians. And they're useless to God. Four. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. These preachers are called lampstands. The word of God is the light. And Christians, especially preachers, are to be lamps which convey the light of God or the word of God to this world which loves darkness, as Jesus said, because their deeds are evil. You say, well, some aren't going to like that. Well, does that matter? I don't see anything anywhere in the Holy Bible that even suggests that that matters. Live holy, if you're a Christian. Proclaim the holy word of God, especially if you're a preacher. And let good people be blessed and bad people be uncomfortable. That's the way it should be. Five. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. And we learn from this that anyone who comes against a man of God who is faithfully preaching the word of God will experience more trouble from God than they can handle. Anyone who tries to hurt a faithful preacher of God's word in any way will experience God's wrath. They may hurt that preacher, but God will hurt them even more. Verse 6. These men have power to shut up the sky so that it will not rain during 
the time they are prophesying. And they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. In other words, God equips these two preachers to do what he wants them to do. Don't ever think that you can't do the good that you know God has commanded you to do in his word. Don't ever think that you can't do it. When God commands, he also equips. When God says in his word, do this, he gives you the ability to do it. And when he says, don't do this, he gives you the ability to not do it. It may not be easy. There may be pain involved. But he will enable you to do it through the pain and through the pressure. Amen.